Hello, this is Avery Berkemeyer here with Tyler Hafford and Penobscot Financial Advisors, and this is Financial Discretion Advised. Welcome to episode one. We're talking the F word. What is it? When do you use it? Is it a verb? Is it a noun? Might be an adverb. I know what you're thinking. Fiduciaries. Let's go. What is a fiduciary? A fiduciary is just somebody that has a special place of trust when working with a client. They either have a legal obligation or an ethical obligation to work in that client's best interest. Right. So in our industry, you can be a fiduciary. You don't always have to be a fiduciary. You can be held to what's called a suitability standard. And one of the main ways that you can kind of differentiate this, because it seems like everybody these days can call themselves a financial advisor. You yeah. can be a guy selling that life insurance out there named sure, a financial sorry. advisor. I, I got a burrito from lunch downstairs from a guy who's a financial advisor. <laughs> Hope he gave you a dollar off or something, you know, really not breaking the bank. But anyways. Um, one of the main differentiating factors that you can tell uh, if somebody is a fiduciary is if they're registered with the SEC. If you have that SEC oversight, then you have to work in a fiduciary capacity, but you still might not have to work in a fiduciary capacity all the time. So if a financial advisor gives you a business card and it says, we got a broker dealer at the bottom, yeah, that's when you know they might be able to sell you something, get a kickback or a commission, and only be held to a su- suitability standard, and not that fiduciary standard. Yeah, you know? and I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you kind of a good breakdown of, of the big difference, right? The suitability standard versus the fiduciary standard. It comes down to the the old analogy of the the butcher and the dietitian, right? So you go into the butcher shop, you're hungry for dinner. You look at the butcher, you say, "What can I eat for dinner?" He's gonna tell you, "I got T-bones, I got steak, I got Delmonico's, Delmonico's, you know, yeah, steaks. I think I heard a chicken clucking in the back, right?" I don't he's, know why you're going anywhere else. It sounds pretty good. Well, and that's what he's gonna <laughs> tell you, right? Dinner's right there, and he can he makes a good argument that you're hungry and this is food, so that, you know this is suitable for your situation. What he's never going to tell you is that, Abram, your cholesterol is too high. you got to head out the door, walk down to the fish market, and pick up some fish and vegetables. right? He's only going to sell you what's in the store. The dietician is going to look at you, run your tests, give you blood levels, and say, listen, Abram, you can have a little bit of the steak, but you got to get some fish and vegetables in there. Uh, this is how you do it. Now, you have the choice to still go to the butcher shop and get your steak. You can still go down and get your fish and your vegetables. Right. What you don't want to hear is that the, the butcher has been paying the dietitian to make sure you end up over there buying the steak, right? right. So in, in this kind of financial world we live in, brokers, stock brokers, financial advisors who aren't registered in the, under the SEC, they're your butcher. You have an SEC registered CFP or financial advisor, you're talking to a dietitian. And Abram, I know you started your career out saying, I want to be the dietitian in this whole thing, right? Right. Uh, walk us through that decision because it's it's not everyone's path into the financial advising. Yeah, and honestly, I didn't wholly know what I was getting into at the start, and but kind of just like my baseline inclinations kind of brought me to where I'm at today and ended up being the best decisions I've ever made. But right. Uh, where I started at was, you know, being a financial advisor is my first professional job outside of college. I was studying to be an actuary, and for those who don't know what an actuary is, essentially it's just a person that does a bunch of math and yeah. can somewhat talk to people. And I'll let listeners know this makes perfect sense. Abram with that spreadsheets is incredible. I think he has one for which color underwear he's going to wear this week. But. Yeah, yeah, today's, today's orange, so. <laughs> um, but generally, I was doing actuarial mathematics, taking some really tough exams, kind of bartending my way through college. And so, you know, I had the, had the math side, had the interpersonal side, got involved in an investment committee through college to kind of got me into, into finance. And I was, I was applying around to do financial advising jobs, but also still some actuarial jobs at the time. And um, so I was much more well-versed in, you know, I could go work for an insurance company as an actuary, but if I'm a financial advisor, what do I do? Right, you know, right. I met with people from life insurance, and I'd, my financial advisor role would be to go out and sell life insurance. And yeah. I didn't really want to do that, turn that down. Um, that, didn't, then, that didn't sound like financial planning to you? No, it sounded like good in commissions, but you know, I'm not totally in it for the money. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, then the other option was, you know, kind of the more traditional financial advisor role where you do investment management and and financial planning. And for that, I was interviewing with a company out of Boston where, you know, they 
pretty easy interview process, not gonna lie. And yeah. They were pretty much like, you're hired, yep. you, know, you, you seem like you're suave enough, you can go out there and sell. And sure. you know, I, my immediate red flags with that job was, one, my base salary was 40,000, so like, how am I even gonna live in the city? <laughs> no, you're not, you're not even buying a cup of coffee when you're making 40K yeah. in the city. Exactly, and then, and then you know, the rest of my compensation was gonna be based on production, which means I was gonna have to go out there, sell, and get kickbacks and commissions for the rest of my income, and that's how I was gonna have to survive. Yeah. I was gonna have to get out there and just grind and you know, maybe sell folks products or services that they don't necessarily need just to be able to sustain myself. And, um, you know, I wasn't really in love with that sure. type of model. And um, I'm pretty sure it was the, the day that I turned that job down, I had my, my first interview here with Penobscot and just the whole, the whole different business model where Penobscot was getting away from working with a broker dealer at that point. Uh, we were registered with the SEC. And, uh, you know, it was like right when I got hired, it was, I was like, when can I start? And they're like, right. a couple months, we just, we just made this giant switch away from a broker dealer. Yeah, and, uh, you're like, dude, I just got out of college. Pay yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, now like, I hear I need you. Some <laughs> here. Um, and so went through, went through that process. And right as I joined on, you know, we dropped all of our, our life insurance licenses and everything and just became a full fiduciary 100% of the time. Sure. That's been the world I've been operating in ever since I joined the industry. And, you know, I, really, I say I really looked out at the beginning because, you know, I really don't see any other way that I would like to work with clients. Sure. I don't want to be out there being incentivized, having this, you know, kind of the angel on one shoulder telling me, like, oh, this is going to be good for them. They need this. Yeah. The devil on the other side. But, oh, but you get paid a little bit more, even if you give them this other product. Yeah. And yeah. Then, you know, that, devil, the, that devil's always holding big money in his hand when he's talking. Right. About yeah. yeah. He's yeah. got uh, dollar signs for us <laughs> and everything. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, really happy where I ended up, couldn't ask for a better model, not really a big fan of, you know, taking advantage of people. I like to be able to go out there and, and help them the best way that I know how, and that's under that's under a fiduciary model and being a fiduciary for all of my clients. Yep. So you pretty much did the exact opposite as me. What, yeah. What did you kind of tell your story? Yeah, completely, right. completely opposite, right? So I was a pre-law major, thought I'd go on to be an attorney. Uh, did some work in that area, realized pretty quickly uh, I don't want to be an attorney. Well, that's probably the first good decision that you made. Yes. Right that. Any attorney, clients listening, please, <laughs> we love you. Network. Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I ended up jumping into that uh, wirehouse world, got hired by one of the, the bigger wirehouses. They kind of draw you in with this thought you're going to make a ton of money. They send you out there. You have to go find your own clients. Uh, they give you a three-month window there, and if you're not hitting production numbers, then they, they get rid of you. So, nice. yeah, really learning by fire. And I remember, you know, I was doing this for a while. I was building my book. I was kind of surviving, making it work. And uh, the dip in, in 2018 in December, right, the market hit, what, almost fell 20% there right before Christmas. And my revenue and numbers all tied to market performance just because I bring it in. And yeah. I remember it wasn't explicitly t to me that I would lose my job if I didn't do this, but... It was highly encouraged that I go through my book, find anyone close to retirement who was nervous, and try to sell them an annuity. And yeah. it was for that kind of revenue spike to, to make up the difference. And, you know, at that point, I, I kind of had this internal battle of, if I'm going to be doing this, I need to be doing it right. And just because I'm making a 5% rip or commission off of this does not mean it's the most suitable situation for the person sitting across the table from right. me. Um, and, you know, at that point, I started searching around. Is there a better way to do this? And the more I learned about the RIA model, the more I learned about, you know, sworn fiduciaries in every aspect of this job, yeah. uh, the more I fell in love with it. And, and luckily, P Penobscot Financial Advisors reached out at that time, and it ended up working. But, um, you know, you work in that model, and it is such a doggy dog world that you find yourself caught up in situations where you have to make decisions. And is it really for the best for the client or is it the best that I can keep my job and, and do this another right. day? And um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely an opposite route that you kind of took in. But I got to tell you, I'm working on some designations to throw at the end of my name right now. Some yeah. some letters there. You went out and said, I'm going to get a whole bunch of letters after my name. So right. what are the de designations you have? Why would you get them? Sure. Um, yeah. Talk to that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And I'll definitely pull in how they how they align with being a fiduciary as well. So one of the designations that I know you're going after right now uh, was the first designation that I got as well, was a certified financial planner. 
that one you um, get a great depth of knowledge in all things financial planning. So we're talking retirement planning, investment planning, cash and debt management, estate planning, you know, soup to nuts, risk management, tax planning. Those are the big six. Right. You know, the things we'll, things we'll touch upon in other podcasts. I'm thinking that's about six more than the guy who sold me the burrito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... You know, once you once you go through that coursework, it takes a couple of years. You get a broad depth, broad breadth of knowledge in financial, all things financial planning, and to have that designation, you are then held to standards by the CFP board. So it's this, right. you know, this private organization that gives out the designation and holds their designees or fo- folks that are in the with the CFP designation to account and. If you have that designation, you have to be a fiduciary at all times in your planning work. So, you know, even though we're a wholly independent registered investment advisor and we are a fiduciary to our clients all the time, um, that CFP board is also holding me to a fiduciary standard at all times. So, you know, there might be shocking that the certified financial planning board wants their financial advisors to care about their clients. I know. I yeah. dare they. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that that really is kind of the niche of my work. I work a lot on financial planning, that's my expertise. Uh, but I do sit on our investment committee as well as within the company. And for that, I decided to go after my accredited investment fiduciary designation through FI360. And uh, the reason I really wanted to get that is, uh, one, I wanted to contribute more to our investment committee and our investment process. And sure. really, when it comes down to being an investment fiduciary, everything that trips up a fiduciary when it comes to investing comes down to uh, process and so that's really what the designation harps on helps you get that process in line and so um, you know I'm able to bring that expertise to the financial planning committee uh, even though it's not my lead role within the company yeah Um, it's nice that it's nice that you carry your weight a little bit more than you were yeah yeah at least I can say that for one of us Tyler okay (laughs) hey I'm still holding on to some holiday weight thank you hey the holidays are coming back up so watch out Um, but I know you're also going after your your CFB and that should be wrapped up soon sure which is good um, I do. I am interested, though, and in, you know, when when you look at how you work with clients between when you were working with the wirehouse and now you're working under this model. I know when you're working as a fiduciary, it's really relationship based, sure. kind of more transaction based in in your old setting. Have you seen a big difference? Yeah, huge difference in how I approach situations. Right, I've, I've completely removed the little devil that sits on my shoulder yeah. uh, when I'm making decisions for for folks. Right, an annuity in its sense can have a great fit into a financial plan. Right. It just has to be the right fit. Right. And if I'm selling the annuity just because I'm trying to make some commission numbers, um, that's not the right fit for the client, right? right? And I think if you're out there shopping for a financial advisor, the number one question you need to be asking are is, are you a fiduciary? Right. And if you are not asking that question, or if that's the only question you're asking, you can, you can continue shopping if they're not, right? Yeah. If you were going to a doctor and they were not acting in your best interest, you'd want walk out the door and find a new doctor. Why we don't treat that the same in the financial advising world is beyond me. Um, you know, I think we have this sense that regulation in the government's going to help take care of this. Well, sure. there's a lot of special interest groups on Wall Street that want to make sure that that rule doesn't get applied yeah. to all types of financial advising because there is a lot of money to be made on those financial products. Those transactions, they keep going, more yep. transactions, more money flowing. Listen, you don't buy prime real estate in Manhattan if you're not selling a bunch of life insurance. <laughs> but, you know, I think that you, that's where you should start that conversation. There's a number of questions you should be asking. Are you a fee-only advisor? And I think that's a a whole nother episode but it gets to the point of who's paying you and if the person who you're talking to if you're not the only one paying them then you might as well keep searching because you you need the person who's giving you financial strategies and looking at your financial world to be acting in your best interest and if it is any other person's interest or any mutual fund company or any life insurance or annuity uh, company that's going to give them a kickback um, I think that you need to you need to find someone else. Yeah, and I think one of those big red flags is if if you don't understand how your advisor is compensated, or if that compensation is very complex, there should be little red flags going off in your head. I always, you know, it it always seems a little funny, but sometimes I get these prospects that come in and they either you know 
wrote down a list of questions that they heard from NPR that says, these are the six things you should be asking your financial advisor. Or they have a little right. printout, and it's like they're explaining terms, and they're like going through the printout, checking off boxes, like, are you this, are you this, are sure. you that? Sure. And, you know, almost every time, the, the top one is, are you a fiduciary? Sure. And then, how are you compensated? But um, that fiduciary piece is, is key. And yeah, you never really know if, you know, like, like we said, under that hybrid model, you could be... If, if somebody's, if an advisor's got a broker dealer, then they might be working with you in a fiduciary capacity. But maybe ten years down the road, that guy's that yeah. advisor is in a tough position and needs to pad his pockets and sells you something on a commission basis. And and let me let me put it this way to you: When I started in my meetings, when I was working under the wirehouse, it was not with "I'm not a fiduciary." <laughs> I, that that conversation never happened, right. right? And all these financial plans and things I could put together for clients, they were sales tools. Yeah. How can I get to the end result here, and how can I maximize how much money I'm making? Um, and it doesn't have to be what the clients pay me. Is there someone else out there who's going to pay me for this, right? So, right. Um, no, I think I think you need to find someone that is only being paid by you, who has your best interests at heart, and is ready to treat your money like it's their own money. Right. And I think that's exactly uh, where you start and end when you're looking for yeah. a financial advisor. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody's trying to sell you something they wouldn't buy themselves. <laughs> yeah. Do you want that? <laughs> and I think, I, to be honest, I think that conversation just sums up right there, right? Yeah. Is this is this person we're acting for me? And if not, then then so be it. If they are, then all right, we can continue on a little bit more. Yeah. But. Yeah. So when you think when you think of looking for a financial advisor, or you already have a financial advisor, always good to remember if are they a fiduciary? Ask them if you don't remember, yeah. and if they're a fiduciary, one hundred percent of their time in their relationship with you, because it's just the the best service and the the best relationship to have. Perfect. I think you said it right. Let's get the F out of here. The foregoing content reflects the opinions of Penobscot Financial Advisors and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security. There is no guarantee that the statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Thank you.